Hey, everybody, and uh, welcome to another episode of The Rad Life. Uh, today, I have a, a guest that I've been wanting to have on for a while, Mayor of Costa Mesa here in Orange County, Katrina Foley, who basically is running for re-election this year in 2020. And I wanted to talk to her about a whole bunch of stuff. She's have been on city council for a bit of time. And she, like I said, she's running for re-election. So she is going to be able to provide an interesting perspective, I think, for Costa Mesa, uh, where it's been, where it's going, and some of the exciting things that they are working on. So I'm going to uh, see if we can get uh, Mayor Foley uh, in here uh, from the waiting room. Um, and touch base with her on her campaign and how it's been to be on city council for like, good morning, good afternoon, Mayor Foley, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well, thanks for having me. And my pleasure, um, for those for those that, that caught that, we tried to do this interview a little earlier in the day, but you know, good old technology and in the age of COVID, we had to kind of reschedule. So I'm really glad to have you on and that we were able to pull this together. Um, I mentioned when I was, um, I was introducing you that you have an interesting perspective because you've been on city council for a while and you're running for re-election and the city um, has changed and sort of it's an exciting time even though the challenges that we are facing right now uh, with COVID but you guys have actually also been very innovative and very responsive when it came to the crisis that we're kind of going through. Yeah so for sure, the city has changed since I was first elected in 2004. Uh, that that time, really, the big controversies of the day were how many trees could we get a project to put in their uh, parking lot, um, whether or not we would use uh, certain types of trees or native plants in the landscaping uh, yeah. medians. I mean, simple stuff, right? And now we're dealing with major life-changing uh, policy-making decisions. I mean, literally life and death this, this last six months. How, how, I mean, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people uh, were super responsive. Like I was actually very pleasantly surprised when this happened, how quickly people mobilized in, a, in, in, in the most, fundamental ways. Some things dragged, but a lot of the basics, uh, people just jumped on. So um, maybe maybe walk us through a little bit, like when this thing happened, obviously nobody expected it. Right. How did you guys mobilize? Well, we had a little bit of a head start because remember, uh, they wanted to move the cruise ship uh, patients to Costa Mesa to Fairview Development Center. That's right. And they were going right. to do some makeshift uh, holding area there. They had no plan. We had many conference calls with the CDC and with the federal government, and they couldn't answer some of the most basic questions, which in fact, droplets. At that time, we had Andrea Marr, who's on our city council. She's an engineer. So she was asking all these questions about droplets, and I had no idea what she was talking about at the time. But now I'm like the expert expert on droplets, right? <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so we kind of got a head start in that January, February timeframe, really learning about what is COVID-19? How could it impact our community? What do we need to do to prepare? So we were the first city in Orange County of the 34 cities to open up our emergency operations center. We were the first city to issue the mask ordinance. We were the first city to um, really kind of shut down parks and, and yeah. other places. Yeah, I, I remember actually, I, I completely forgot but I'm on the board for Project Independence, and we actually have people that are clients of ours that live nearby there. And, and I remember when this came up on the news, I'm like, oh, I know where that is. And I'm like, really? You know, this is going to require a little bit of, you know, logistics to make this happen. And so you're telling me, like everybody else, like we didn't even know that droplets was a word we're going to basically be talking about all the time now. Like, yeah. Yeah, pass the bread and here's the droplets. I'm like, it's like, you know, where's the mask? Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. And, and, and so what was there, was there any contention? I just want to talk about the mask thing for a minute because right. you and I, I think, you know, we share, we share kind of a, That's right. a, a hand you know, a, that there's a direct connection. It was it fair. You got your mask on you. Okay. Mask up so that we can open. Ah, up. That's what I you, say. You thought I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. There. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, uh, I've got several versions. I have a, a collection now. <laughs> I, I need to get you one from the company I set up. 
I need yeah. to get you one from TaylorMade face masks. You need to go over and- I saw Lucy Dunn has a really beautiful one that you- Lucy, Lucy has one of ours, yes. And I, I do have a bunch. We just put out, I just added some patriotic patterns and there'll be a bunch of other ones that are coming up this week. But yeah, my treat, because I, 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 I'm re I was really happy to see uh, you know, people like yourself and Lucy, where we really realized that there was a direct connection between that expression of safety, right? And projecting that as, as, as what you stand for and the health and well-being of the economy. Like there right. was a direct connection when people were basically dealing with it like it was a separate entity, unfortunately. And you guys were, were very, very early on pushing for that. Was there consensus on council? Was it, was it sort of a, a difficult thing to get to uh, happen? It was the, the council voted uh, six to one for the masks. And so it was overall consensus. Um, yeah. And um, the, the city manager issued the order first and then the council ratified. Uh, and then of course, you know, the governor followed suit and thereafter the whole state was right. part of our masks as well as the county of orange and the health officer so you know we i one of the experiences that i've had during this whole pandemic is that i was invited with hundreds of other mayors to participate in this bloomberg philanthropy uh weekly covid19 response training okay. and so I got the benefit of learning about what is COVID-19, what is the public health response, what are things that are happening across America so mm -hmm. that we can be prepared in advance. What are, what are the things we need to do um, to help our community to stay safe and to keep our, our economy open? That's always been what we've been trying to connect the two because we need to have both a healthy community in terms of our our personal health, but also our economic health. And the Absolutely. two are just completely intertwined in this particular pandemic. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, okay. Katrina, I'm, I'm just, I was gonna ask you relevant to that because, um, you know, that, that kind of was a bit of a mess in most places where it was like, are we on, are we open, are we closed, you know? And, and I think right now, just an overall, we, we suffer a lot of doubt and distrust of sources of information. So, so I noticed that you guys were actually very um, proactive in how you were putting out your collateral material. You were using social media quite a bit. You were doing things that were very, what would I call them, like visually stimulating to get people to engage. I, I'm, I'm just going to ask this because I think I already know the answer, but that was a conscious strategic decision from you guys, right, to do this? Oh, of course. Yes, yeah. for sure. We, it was a combination of, you know, our new city manager, she's been on the job for a year, um, but she's been through crises before. So she had crisis management experience. We have an emergency operations manager who also, he has really good emergency response experience. And then the, the lessons that I was learning in terms of crisis management and what are some tools that you can use to share information quickly with your community um, from the Bloomberg program was invaluable. And one of the things that I learned other mayors were doing, and so I quickly uh, followed suit, is we created a Coast, Restore Costa Mesa recovery team. And it was comprised of Smart. about 40 business leaders, our nonprofits, uh, our faith-based community, and our city team. Um, and we were really able to engage the, the community of business community, and as well as our Sagerstrom Center for the Arts. We've got the yeah. arts building right here I, behind I see me. it behind you, yeah. Yeah, and so we quickly, we had weekly Zoom meetings every Friday for about two hours where we would gather all of the concerns that they were having. What do they need us to do to change the zoning code so they can get outside or so that they can socially distance? And we were able to move bureaucracy in a way that has never happened before. So the problem is though, is that now we know it can be done. <laughs> so some of these uh, long delays are probably uh, not gonna be appreciated anymore. I, 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 rem I remember when, when, I, when I, like I said, when it first started and how quickly we just overall as a, as a nation, as a human race basically adapted to this because this didn't spare anybody, it was global. Right. And, and that was exactly my second thought. It was like, well, so if we just did this 
this fast, why the heck does it take so long to do it under normal circumstances? And do you ever get a chance now to put the genie back in the bottle? Because now it's not, this isn't, this wasn't like where you have a crisis, like even a hurricanes, right? I mean, it, let's say that there, it's not Katrina. Let's say it's not, you know, like, like a, 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 a thing that has a, a, a ripple effect that long lasting, right? In your case, it's a very positive ripple effect that's long lasting, right? But, <laughs> but yeah, but, 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 you know, I where, tend to where, be a bit of a hurricane at times. Though. Well, you know what? <laughs> I, I don't necessarily personally think that's a bad thing, by the way, right? They can be constructive, yeah. but, uh, but where, where it doesn't, it's not a weekend. It's not like I just had a little right. debris on the beach, right? This is six months almost, and it's likely to be a little longer where the ripple effects of this are with us. So there have been behavior pattern changes, right? There have been inst institutional changes of dealing with stuff. Right. So, so, so we, I think uh, to answer your question about whether we put the genie back in the bottle, I actually think many of the changes that we've made in Costa Mesa, uh, allowing restaurants to expand their patio space mm -hmm. to some public space, opening up some of our public rights of way, um, making it easy to get a quick permit for mm -hmm. something that you want to do and an event type of permit. We never had this permit system before. I don't think that goes away. I think some of the restaurants that are sort of makeshift in what, you know, they can't really keep it like that because it's not right. very nice, you know, right, right. that will probably go by the wayside and they'll go back inside. But for some spaces, I mean, they've adapted. I'll, I'll give you an example. Memphis. Yeah. Um, I just went to Memphis for brunch. It's one of our favorite uh, breakfast places. I have uh, I have my own little concoction that I get there. It's the crab cake Benedict. It's not on Ooh. the menu. <laughs> And we've been going there for more than 20 years. Right. Um, so heartbreaking, because I know Dan Bradley, the owner, he's a neighbor. He lives in Costa Mesa. It's family owned, heartbreaking when they had to shut down. Um, and you know, they have little kids and everything. So yeah. when they were able to open up their back and take a little piece of their gravel parking lot mm -hmm. and expand, and it's turned out beautiful. They put up a nice little fence and picnic tables with umbrellas. Uh, I hope that stays. I want that to stay there because that's a benefit and a value, not just to the business, but to the community. You yeah, know, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, thank you for answering it this way because I was hoping you would. Like, I agree with you 100%. There has been a lot of happy accidents, if you will, that have come out of this. And, uh, you know, when, when, when I look at what happened in Laguna Beach, for example, where they closed that forest and basically all of a sudden it's a pedestrian walkway. And I remember I live in San Clemente. And, you know, the back and forth that we would, like just about activating the Paseos behind Del Mar. And now we see, and, and so in many ways, good and bad, and in some definitely good, yeah. I think COVID we will look back at as having as accelerated a process that we were maybe wanting to be on right. out of necessity. And I don't think we should put those back in the bottle. Now it's going to be interesting, for example, you know, now that you've opened up delivery with alcohol sales, does that go back into the bottle? I don't think so. Probably not. Too much money involved, right? So, so. But that, that one does have its uh, consequences and we have to be really careful about exactly. that one because of DUIs. You know, we were, people were staying home, so it was probably okay. But uh, when, when I saw the governor pass that, um, uh, order and allowed that. So my family, uh, uh, my on my husband's side, they're from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so we always tease how you can get a drive up, you know, pina colada yep. at the drive through and, yep. and then yep. drive away with your pina colada. It's open container. Easy. I'm driving around with an open container. Yeah. yeah. So I worry, uh, you know, certainly about DUIs, and so we have to make sure to manage that well. Yeah, and and, and like every like anything else that's that that's a first. I mean, look at I mean, I, I I have clients that are basically in the legal profession, and just what's happening with with just court cases and civil cases versus criminal cases. I mean, there's certain things that we will come out of this, and we will have developed probably an alternative way of doing things. Um, so with that in mind, at my the, old law firm has done the same. I mean, we yeah. we've, we've uh, pivoted. We downsized during this process um, and uh, have gone online. And now I'm doing all my depositions online and right. kind of nice. So, so what, <laughs> so, so to that point, as a business owner, I mean, uh, that's, that's what happens now with the, um, when we have so much real estate, I mean, before COVID commercial real estate was suffering. 
you know, the impact of online sales, things of that nature, people had to really get creative and basically drawing in foot traffic to their businesses. And some of them that are larger that are that are in your city have the machinery and the mechanisms and the, the manpower to do that. Some of the smaller ones don't. And, you know, like, I know uh, Shaheen at the lab, for example, they do their own thing, even though it's a one off versus a chain. And so some were lucky, some were not. We now are faced with another layer to this, which is the fact that we have found out that we don't need as much square footage to conduct a business. Right. So that, to your point, maybe now we need, and, and, and you, you were gonna, you're, I'm gonna let you tell us about the, you know, the, the, the uh, general plan and any of that stuff that's happening at the city level, because from a visioning perspective, I would think that now we have a little bit more clarity about what we're facing and what we need to basically tackle, right? When it comes to maybe adaptively reusing or repurposing some real estate that we have? Yeah, I think it's a little premature for us to decide that because we're still, everybody's forced to still be at home. There's plenty of parents that are working from home that would not want to be working from home if they had a choice. Um, it's very hard, I, I know, as a parent of two now college age sons, uh, when they were young, I used to bring them to the office with me. Um, they would have, I'd have a little pack in play, but I was my own, you know, business owner right. and I could do that. I'm my own boss. Um, so I know that, that right now working at home is forced on many employees. And so we'll have to wait and see what really happens. We are social animals. Everyone wants to be together. I don't think the conference rooms go away. I don't think the need to have spaces where people gather go away. It's just gonna be paused for a bit of time. But commercial um, real estate is gonna change for sure because a good number of companies will wanna save money and they will have everyone working remotely because now they're all set up to. I mean, right. they have the infrastructure now, they were forced to develop it in their firms. So I do think it'll change, but you know, maybe that's a better way for us to get to more mixed uh, retail, housing, office. Um, I've always been a fan of mixed use. Um, we're starting to really develop a lot of mixed use in the Sigerstrom Center for the Arts area and the South Coast Metro area. We've got mixed use uh, coming before us above the 405 freeway. We have some pseudo mixed use over on Placentia on the west side. Mm -hmm. It's not really, it's not real. It's just a, you know, it was a way to get more uh, footage, square footage for the housing. It's right. real. When I'm saying mixed use, I mean where you don't have to get in your car to go to work because right, there's right. your work is there and yeah. all the amenities there. So it's work, like work live basically. In yeah, some exactly. Calling, right? Yeah. So, so speaking of which, I understand you have a full house right now. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so, some excuses of my own. <laughs> so, I, so, so you know of what you speak when, when you're talking about this. Um, what are some of the things um, that you're looking forward to, you're running for re-election. So, you know, what are you looking forward to in your next term that would, that is sort of exciting for Costa Mesa? I've seen a lot of changes. I've been, I've, I mean, I've been in South County since 87 and I pretty much gave up my office a long time ago and my office is the center club basically. Okay. Uh, right, pretty <laughs> much. Right I, there in the heart I, of the I'm, I'm, right, I'm right there. And I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of changes. Um, to locations changing hands, to repurposing, right? So what? share with us some of the stuff that you're excited about for Costa Mesa. Well, we've done so much just in the last two years. It's been an exciting two years. Before COVID, we were on a roll. You know, we built a new fire station. We built a new library, state-of-the-art library, beautiful library. Um, uh, we built... We were in construction on a new community center, which we've continued on. It opens in the end of September. I'm excited about that. We're naming it after our first woman mayor, um, Norma Herzog. So that's very cool. Fun. Um, we also have new playgrounds going in. We were set to have a whole variety of multi-purpose trail systems come in, and uh, we were working on that. That got, you know, the CIP budget got killed because South Coast Plaza closed. It's a third of our budget. Sure. And so we had to pull back some a little bit, but we're going to get ramped up on that again. Well, it opened again, it opened again yesterday, right? Didn't it open up? It, it, they opened up yesterday. Monday, right? Monday, Monday, yeah. yeah. 
And I was there opening day and everyone was there in their masks shopping, many, many bags coming out of Louis Vuitton and Hermes. So that's good news for Costa Mesa. In fact, I just got a report uh, yesterday on our uh, tax revenue from the January through March time period. And um, we, didn't, we didn't take too much of a hit during that time period. So, you know, the great thing about the plaza uh, is that it really feeds to the highest uh, income earners in our county, in the world, right. and, and they really didn't get hit by the pandemic. So they kept shopping because they couldn't travel. So that was good for us. Um, but, but yeah, so we've been, we're working on our housing element and literally since 2002, I have wanted to do a visioning for our city. What's the vision? What do we want to be when we grow up? You know, do we want to keep building all this hodgepodge or do we want to create a plan for the community for the next 50 years? And sure. so finally we have a council who believes in a vision plan. <laughs> and sure. so we, got, we approved that over the last few weeks and we're embarking on our housing element, our vision plan. How do we protect our single family neighborhoods, but provide housing the way that we need it? I mean, I'll tell you, my 93 year old grandmother lives with us, my 73 year old mom. And for the last six months, we've been trying to find them housing. There's just nothing that they can afford. It, it's just not possible. Um, and so we're building an accessory dwelling unit in our backyard. That's another change that's happening in the community. And, and I figure that you know, my boys, maybe their, their families might be able to benefit from that. Uh, we happen to have a large backyard, so it works for us. But there's a lot of flexibility that we need to have these days because what we found from COVID is really the extremes in terms of the poverty versus the wealth. And mm -hmm. even all of us that are sort of in the middle, kind of just hanging on by a thread, and then every, when the world falls out from under you, you really don't have a lot except for your asset of your home to hang on to. So um, we need to give people more protection of their homes, more rights to their homes and, and to be able to use them well, more. Well, and, 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 and you, touch, you touch on a couple of things that, that are definitely, um, I think every city in Orange County is dealing with. Um, it, you're, you're dealing with aging population you're dealing with demands that come from that demographic. You're, you're, you know, these are, these are our parents. I got an 84 year old dad that we basically are, you know, and dealing with caregivers and what have you, you know, and, and, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be able to sustain yourself in that capacity, because there's not really a lot of insurance that covers it currently, right. right? right. Um, they're starting, but it's not been there for a while. Uh, that is a real serious concern. And then on the flip side of it, I, you know, kind of, ironically, is that you've got youth that can't afford to stay here right. and basically contribute to the community, whether in terms of leadership or in terms of, you know, payroll taxes or, or, or sales taxes. And, and so I'm really, really happy to hear you say that because yes, housing is a big part of that solution. And, and, you know, I hit, it's almost like, you know, you're saying a four letter word when you say affordable housing in some places, but, but, you know, it's, it, it is a mess. It's a must that we have to address. And if, without a vision plan, you, you don't really have a, uh, a guiding, you know, right. destination or right. light. You're just kind of, yeah. Spot zoning. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're, we've entered into mm -hmm. a exclusive negotiating agreement with Jamboree Housing Corporation mm -hmm. yeah, to great build corporation. senior housing on, at our senior center. We'll take the parking lot. We have a huge parking lot there. We'll yeah. keep the bottom floor all parking so we won't lose any parking and then build the housing, stacking it up, three-story housing there. Now, why would we do that? Well, we have a lot of seniors who are living in homes that they've had since 1969. Yep. The homes need to be repurposed, but they can't move out of the homes because you know, they're still paying the taxes from a $20,000 home, right? And now that home is worth a million dollars. And so they can't move out of that house because there's no place to go and they don't want to leave their community. They're rooted here. So right. now we can move people in to, you know, quality, affordable housing. And then those homes come up and then we can start to have younger families move Moving back. In. In. Yeah. yeah. 
and that'll bring the price of housing down a little bit. It'll, I don't see housing going down. I mean, if it doesn't go down in a pandemic, let me tell you, housing went up by 50,000 on my street during the pandemic. It was shocking. I couldn't believe it. Somebody sold their house for 50,000 more than any other house sold in the neighborhood during the well, pandemic. I, I believe it. I mean, we, le we learned a lesson in 91 where, where we, we have not, I think, overbuilt one, mm -hmm. two, uh, I think, you know, we happen to be fortunate enough to live in a very desirable location, uh, you know, 10, 15 miles in from the coast, whatever it is that, you know, those properties are not going to go down, but it does, it does cause a reality that we have to address through what you, like things like what you just proposed. And I think, you know, that way we keep also those families together that we keep we keep we make that an option if they just so desire to basically still contribute and 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 the the familiarity thing is is huge and i don't think a lot of people you know t discuss it but you know spending 30 40 years in a location knowing where everything is still being healthy enough to drive or get around you are not going to want to basically pack everything and move somewhere right. too far and your friends and your social circle and you and i you were talking about a minute ago about the importance of social you know, we're social animals yeah that becomes even more critically important as you get older right oh for sure and we also have on the horizon over the next few years uh fairview development center the council has approved a plan for uh the fairview development center site it's 114 acres um, it's an opportunity for us to build a community, one that we would be really proud of, that has affordable, not just rental housing, mm -hmm. but housing that people can buy, first time home buyer housing that's affordable. And I'm talking in the four to $600,000 range. I remember when we first bought our first house in Costa Mesa in 1997, mm -hmm. um, we paid $200,000 for the house, okay? That house sold a few years back for $800,000. I mean, it's just uh, the, the way to be able to move up is to be able to right. have property, right. have that equity, and be able to invest in your future. And well, we need to provide that for all members of all sections of our community. Well, and, and it's a way to get people invested in the community too. There's like, you know, there's a personal investment in the community, not just in terms of property, but in terms of just being part of the fabric of the community, which yeah. we all benefit from. And, and you, you, that is that that property is a very interesting opportunity that is almost like one of those unicorns you guys have that isn't really that available anymore close by like this is yeah. this is this is right. right there off harbor um, I'm really I was always wondering what you guys were going to do with that and that sounds like a perfect perfect solution where it's yeah, we have a we have a plan that the council approved it's you know it's state-owned property so we have to keep negotiating with the state about what they want to do with our yeah. community <laughs> um, and so we'll keep having those conversations we're fortunate enough to have a, a great advocate in Cotty Pichu Norris who's our assemblywoman yeah. mm -hmm. and we are um you know, we've got that, we've got north of the 405, there's some discussion about how do we maybe build a more urban kind of a development at north of the 405. That's still under discussion. We don't know what those uh, discussions are gonna end up looking like, but we have, these are big things. We also have on our horizon, you know, this council is all about sustainability and trying to be more protective of the environment. Last night we approved a grant for, uh, uh, electric vehicle charging stations that we're going to be having now right at City Hall. I'm a huge uh, electric vehicle uh, fan. I think that if we could all get electric vehicles, we'd be doing a lot for our environment. Ag agreed. Yeah. Um, and then, but the cost of electric vehicles are so high. That's another yes. thing. We've got to get the cost down so that the average person who drives a lot can afford them. Um, and then we have, you know, we hired a sustainability manager. She's going after grants. We're looking at community choice energy. I know that our entire council is very supportive of making our community more walkable and bikeable. And we think that that has an economic driver uh, impact as well as a quality of life impact. So we've got a lot to, to work on over the next two years. I've got two projects that I wanna get done. I've been Perfect. working on a making our flood channels, turning them into multi-purpose trails for eight years. If I can finish my term on this council and get that project done, I'll be very happy. Um, and then also just sort of beginning to end, beginning and ending our housing element, um, trying to work on Newport Boulevard, 
what are we going to do? Are we right. going to be uh, housing? Are we going to be hotels? Uh, what are we doing with Newport Boulevard? It's just a hodgepodge and it has, um, you know, it's seen its day. We've got, to, we've got to repurpose it. Well, and you've got that bottleneck that happens at the end. I mean, like, so definitely an area that needs to be looked at as yep. maybe, you know, like a helicopter view, overall master planning. Mm -hmm. um, so what, tell me about this measure that you guys have that I think you just approved relevant to, to go on for uh, the voters mm -hmm. for, for cannabis, because there's only one other place in Orange County where that is legally, you know, retail stores and what have you, and that's Santa Ana. So Costa Mesa, interesting. Tell me a little more about that. Yeah, well, we had been working on that before COVID. Uh, we had an ad hoc committee, myself, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens and council member Chavez, and we put together a, a, a group of industry experts. Uh, we met with them by Zoom for several months, um, getting everyone's feedback. And then we made a recommendation to the council and we have a ballot measure to allow retail and home delivery in Costa Mesa in the commercial zones. And we have some buffers of sensitive uses, thousand foot buffer from schools and parks and playgrounds and right. um, other sensitive uses. So. Um, and we're estimating, I think they're conservative in their estimates. They're saying 3 million. I know Santa Ana's at nine at this point. So yeah. I, I think these are conservative estimates, but, but regardless, our goal is to have very high end cannabis retail, uh, in the city of Costa Mesa to match our high end luxury brand in, uh, on the North part of town and the South Coast Plaza area. And then also to, um, you know, get rid of these rogue dispensaries. Mm -hmm. We are, um, we have just such a hard time eliminating the rogue dispensaries uh, because people just think it's legal. They don't know that they're going right. into a shop that's illegal because they think, oh, marijuana is legal. I can go over there and, and buy whatever, my edible or whatever it is. Uh, but so we don't, um, we just have a hard time. There's a, you can't believe, you think that you can just shut some business down. Um, that's just not the case. I mean, it is very, very difficult to shut these places down. You have to have a whole, you know, six months of evidence. And even when you shut them down, it's like whack-a-mole. They come in at night, they break the locks, they open up and people come in, it's like a pop-up or something. Yeah. So we've had yeah. a hard time. Well, and, and, and I've heard stories where they just basically reappear under another, you know, doing yeah. business as or whatever, right. and it's somewhere other part of town. And, and for those who are listening to this, you know, I've, I've, I've done a quite a bit of background. You guys obviously have, you know, there used to be a place in Beverly Hills in Barney's of New York called the high end. Mm -hmm. And it was a retail store at the top. That thing didn't, that looked like a high end jewelry store. Right. And, it, and, and there was wide glove service and what have you. So, it is definitely doable, but I definitely agree with you. I think the biggest benefit of doing something like this is where you basically control these rogue uh, locations because there's a genuine risk to the com community yes. with the products being, you know, it's almost like supplements that are unregulated or things of that nature. And, and you've got, you've got on, the, on the consumer side, you've got everybody, everybody from people that are very astute and very seasoned in, 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 in cannabis because they've been doing it sort of under the radar forever, you know, and they're people that are absolutely new to it. And, and so they're just walking into an unknown and, and yeah, it's happening in your city. So I'm, I was actually very excited to see that. I, I, I think done responsibly, not only is it economically a, 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 a boom, but it also is something that sh it's time. Right. Yeah, and so right. And really we have glad. stores, we have stores um, that are, adjacent to these rogue dispensaries and you know they've got odor coming into their stores yeah. they have uh people taking up all the parking they've got people coming out of cars with like grocery not grocery bags but plastic bags filled with cannabis and running up into the shop i mean it's really dangerous it's not a safe environment and uh, we're doing everything we can within the law to shut them down but once we have a legal process, mm -hmm. it'll be a lot easier because if they don't have, um, you know, they don't have their business license, they're not permitted, we can then go after the property owners who are allowing this. It'll be a lot easier. 
Well, yeah, but right now there's nothing that regulates it. And by putting those regulations in place, then you can enforce them. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, again, also thank you for going back to the masks for a minute. Um, you guys not only mandated masks, but you also enforce them. And, you know, you have the ability to do that because you got your own, you know, team that can do that, right? Versus other cities are, are maybe more county based. But I was really thrilled when I saw that sign driving down on Red Hill, you know? And I was like, here it is, it's black and white, you're entering the city, you know, it's like, it's like in those movies when you're entering the city and there's the, there's the, you know, Kiwanis sign or the, you know, you've entered the population numbers. Here's this blinking sign that's like, you know, don't even think about it, wear a mask, $100 yeah. fine. Well, I have noticed definitely a change when, because um, we had this law on the books since, what, April? Yeah. Um, but as soon as we started putting the signage up and really letting people know the education period is over, um, I think you saw a lot more people wearing their face masks, both in stores and also, I mean, I mean, people don't realize, but stores were contacting us and calling the police and saying, you know, we've got these people who refuse to wear their masks coming in. What can we do? Um, they wanted us to have a fine. I mean, they've, I was asked by several restaurants, please do some enforcement. Because once you start doing the enforcement, then it'll just become easy for us as a business to enforce. Yeah, Katrina, that's one of the things that I actually felt was the most unconscionable uh, sort of thing because you had these businesses that were struggling to hold on they were doing everything in their power their energies are all focused on that they're trying to bring back their staff and then now in certain places we were saying well the state mandated masks but you know what you're kind of on your own to enforce and i thought that was such an unfair thing to burden the businesses with when they're so overwhelmed yeah. and so I, I i mean it wholeheartedly like for you guys to basically not only mandate because it's the right thing to sound like you're doing but also to stand behind it and enforce yeah i i i'm sure you garnered a lot of uh, good sentiment from a lot of your businesses oh um, yeah but yeah. not from some of the anti-mask uh, community. So, uh, you know, they, they've now started coming to my house. So the last two weekends, they've been protesting out in front of my house, uh, much like they did to the health officer. However, I'm a little, I think, uh, tougher skinned than the health officer. Um, you know, she didn't sign up for that. Um, and then last night, we're having our Zoom city council meeting and there they are in my front yard with their bullhorns yelling about the masks. Um, and you could actually hear it on the city council meeting. It was, you know, I did my best to just try to pretend like it wasn't happening in the background. But um, yeah, isn't there, isn't there, isn't there, they're actually from your community. They're from oh, San oh, 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 I, Trust me, I, I know. <laughs> okay. And if they're lucky, they don't run into me because I'm like, I am, I, I, I cannot even believe you know, what, what Kool-Aid those people are drinking, but, but I, I, just from a practicality, I mean, I've said this to people, I don't care if, if you believe in masks or don't believe in masks, okay? The bottom line is you cannot be pro-business and be anti-mask right now because those exactly. businesses need to project an image of safety to draw in people to spend money. And if you're in the way of that, you can't say that you're there for the business owner. You're not. 100% agree. Right? Yeah. And, and, I think and it's anti-business to be against the mask right it, now. It is. It I is anti-business. Because people, uh, whether it's, there's a small group of people who think it's a hoax, there's nothing to see here. Majority of people, super majority of people either know someone who has had COVID or who has died from COVID or who uh, is helping people who have right. COVID. And so we believe that this is a serious disease and a virus that causes a serious life-changing disease. Right. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to go into a store that doesn't comply with the social distancing. I have only been to five restaurants in six months and I'm somebody who used to go to restaurants probably every day. Right. Uh, and so the restaurants I'm choosing are the ones that are you know, plenty of space, you're outside, all the servers are wearing their masks and you feel like you're safe. You're not going to get COVID by going mm -hmm. and enjoying a nice meal. So like Old Vine Cafe, he's done a great job. He waited, waited, waited until he felt like, you know, the systems were kind of in place. And um, Mario Morovic uh, in uh, Country Club and right. uh, Playa Mesa, they're doing an excellent job. Now, 
Mario, he was kind of on the fence at the beginning, but mm -hmm. he, he understood, he's quickly, he was on my recovery team. He became a huge asset to us on our recovery. He's now involved in testing and getting all the restaurant workers tested because that's another key. You know, we right. got the, the big testing center at the fairgrounds for 10 weeks, the mayor's on these calls with the county. Uh, every Friday, we would say, please, we need more testing. We need testing because the workers, the essential workers, the restaurant workers, grocery clerks, teachers, et cetera, you know, they need to know if they're not feeling well, they need to know if they have COVID so they don't go to work and get everybody sick. Right. Uh, so, so now we've got that going. We've got the masks. You know, I think the numbers, the thresholds are good. I just worry. I hope we can hang on through Labor Day. You know, Labor Day, everyone wants to get together and they're going to get all crazy. I just hope that we don't get too many gatherings going on during Labor Day and, and kind of move backwards. I, I, I have a feeling that we, this is definitely something that, I mean, the way that we have adjusted our lives will be with us for a long time. I think from the medical side of things, again, the virus, the, you know, will be with us for a long time. But I think, I don't know if it's we're going to see a much of a bump other than maybe in certain areas. I don't want to pick it on any cities, but you and I know both certain, both know some areas that we can name right now that will probably have a little bit of a spike. My concern is more about the kids in the schools Yeah. right now, because under normal circumstances, that kid basically goes home with influenza or with the flu and it goes through the whole family. And right now those families, like in your case, may have actually brought in a multi-generations into their household so they can don't stay separated from one another right and so um it's definitely definitely a time that we're dealing with things differently but i don't i don't want i don't want to lose this thing about the business and the importance of sort of that leadership that you guys are providing to those businesses because i think we will look back at this time and we will see who actually rose to the occasion and it may be people we expected would rise to the occasion and it may be completely surprising people that weren't even on the radar screen that rose to the occasion to basically help people navigate through this. I mean, I, 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 I was astounded, not astounded, I was very pleased to, to see that sort of 30 restaurants signed up uh, with AgeWell, for example, you know, to provide food and those restaurants now basically sustained themselves through an economic downturn because of, be, you know, stepping up and being of service to the community. There was a lot of this sort of profit, nonprofit mindset that was happening. And I really hope that that continues to happen because we're all richer for it on many levels, not only financially. I oh, think. for sure. We, um, at the beginning of this, because we all have different strengths on our council and so I worked with our city manager and we kind of divided up the work. Uh, so council members, Mar and Reynolds, they started helping on the food distribution drives. So we've had Ikea, Power of One Foundation, uh, the Chargers, a whole variety of businesses supporting food distribution. I mean, we've given thousands and thousands of meals. Power of One Foundation has given their one millionth meal during the COVID time period. Wow. Uh, so um, our Meals on Wheels program, we activated tons of volunteers that we didn't have before. We increased the number of seniors who are participating on that uh, program by, I think it's almost triple the number of mm -hmm. seniors who are now on the Meals on Wheels program. And uh, so that was something where we probably had those seniors in our community that needed the Meals on Wheels, but they just didn't feel comfortable asking. Right. And this was the opportunity. And so now we're helping them. And it's not just food. You know, the volunteers, when they go out to their homes, they, you know, they do wellness checks. They give that social engagement. Um, and I know that there was a lot of seniors who were getting really isolated. Yeah. So what we did was we started calling seniors. We called thousands and thousands of seniors. Um, Katrina, who's the, who's the provider? Is that, is that Meals on Wheels Orange County? They used yes. to be senior, senior well, service? It's a federal basically? program, but it's funded, you know, through uh, federal funding. But the meals are being provided from a whole variety of restaurants, as well as the, the county program. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and and I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I've, I do red carpet interviews for Meals on Wheels Orange County, which used to be senior serve at the Grove yeah, and they right. do their Senior exactly. Heroes Award. Right. And so isolation is a killer. And, and I think we got, we got a taste of that, regardless of age, to be honest with you, uh, to where we now also possibly have opportunities to connect with people on issues that they would have probably not had a feeling for that now they have a feeling for, such as um, 
you know, quality of life. It, it, I'm, I'm, de I'm dealing with a lot of people right now in my professional capacity from the design perspective in terms of air quality. Like, you know, just in, 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 inside air quality and how that, you know, I, I was astounded. I did some research and it turned out that we spend 90% of our time indoors and we've never really looked at just the air quality and the filtration systems and the age of equipment and things of that nature. And again, driven by the fact that we need to project a safety, a quantifiable safety position some of these people that I'm dealing with are looking beyond the mask only and saying, look, we want to be able to tell our clients, we want to be able to tell our customers that we have gone above and beyond to ensure that the air quality and filtration in the space is as controlling of the, uh, the, the droplets and the particles as possible. Right. Uh, and here's what it is. And I could, I could totally see us sort of from a policy perspective, starting to incorporate that stuff into our building codes, into our requirements. I mean, you know, I, I remind people that the way we build and design rest, uh, restrooms and bathrooms right now all came out of pandemics. The materials that we use, the way we basically do them, they all came out of crises. And, and there will be a lot of things that will manifest themselves out of this. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, the plaza, talk about fil in, uh, ventilation systems, they, they changed their entire ventilation system so that the germs could get killed more easily. Um, they've really, no, you know, they, they have the capital to be able to do that, right. but they, I, I have been saying, I don't think the plaza should have been shut down ever. I feel like the plaza was a unique shopping center as shopping centers go in America where yeah. They have hundreds of housekeepers cleaning and disinfecting. They're able to socially distance. They had all kinds of controls on the number of people going in stores. This is before they got, uh, you know, the, after they got open and then got shut down right. again. And so, um, so I, I've said, if you're going to go shopping, you know, it is if you can go to Vons or Target or right. Walmart yeah. or Stater Brothers, you definitely could go to South Coast Plaza. I would think it's a lot safer. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think anybody, I, I mean, I, I was, when I heard about, you know, we're going to shut down certain things and we're going to, you know, close business and stuff like that. It, it, it was, I felt that it was maybe a, a, an, an overreach in a certain way because it was not sustainable. Now, maybe we needed to do it when we needed to do it as a first step, but no, I, not for a moment did I think it was a sustainable position. I mean, there's no way we're going to do that. And I agree with you on the, on, the, on the plaza. In fact, the plaza did something that was very innovative, and I'm just give a shout out to them, is when they basically turned part of their parking structure into almost yep. like buyer booths, Yep. right? And I really? thought that was... Yes, because this was actually an elevated experience that was luxury based, which was right in line with their brand, right? But still met the requirements of open air, right? So I thought that talk was talk about cutting red tape. Um, I got a call on Wednesday from the Plaza executives. Hey, Mayor, we want you to come down and look at this idea that we have. And I said, okay, uh, should I bring the city manager? Okay, good idea. So the city manager and I come down and then she decides to bring the planning director. And, and so we literally hear the pitch for this idea. And I say, well, I don't think the health officer is gonna allow you to do this, that or the other, let's call him. So we get the health officer on the phone. I tell him what we're planning to do. And he says, no, you can't do that, but you can do this. And I said, okay. And by the weekend, they had it mocked up by Tuesday, we ratified the ability to move outside and to have that done. I mean, we did it but in less than a week, okay? Well, well, you know, necessity is mother of invention and, and people that are motivated, I mean, watch out, get out of the way of people that are motivated to find a solution. They sold a $1.5 million ring in that uh, garage boutique. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, and, well and, and in course of doing that, just think about a proof of concept, right? Like that could become a pop-up version, something other, somebody else may take it and do something like that with it. The other person that I thought, and I, I do want to give him, give him a shout out is my buddy, Amar Santana at Vaca. Oh yes. He's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I, I'll tell you when everybody was sort of really whining not whining rightfully, you know, just being very emotional, passionate, let's just call it what it is. Right. And, and, and about the fact that their business is shut down and, you know, got to be open and da, 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 and, you know, and they were, and then they were given an opportunity to open, but then, you know, they, they were 
going to try to do whatever the minimum they can to open. He actually held back. He actually held back. And I remember talking to him or, or via text, or I think it was on, on social media one time. And I said, well, so what, how's it going? Because I mean, he's got Broadway in Laguna. He's got, fuck, I mean, the, the market at, uh, at, at the, the plaza, hall. at the hall at the plaza, just had ju just, just open. open. I was just at the open. opening for that. Yeah. Right, just open. And they were he just said, getting rolling too, because they open right at the end of the holiday season. And right. And he was all excited. And I remember you know, he was working on his menu and the, the press was starting. He was starting to roll on some press mm -hmm. on it. And, and I said to him, I said, so what's going on? And he goes, you know, I don't want to rush this. And I, I'm like, okay, tell me why. His first, first reason he wasn't rushing it was the safety of his employees. Right. And I, I, Mark I, McDonald, I think they're friends actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, so I really, I really found that to be very honorable. I mean, like we're all facing a crisis. We all really want to get back to, and we'll never get it back to that normal, but to some sort of normalcy. And there was things that were more important than just basically getting that register to start ringing. There was, it, there was other things of value. And, and I really, that's what I mean by some people that, you know, we will look back and we will see some people by example and how they basically behaved in this. And then you got the people that I'm, I'm sorry to say are from my neck of the woods that are, you know, basically harassing people at mother's market and, and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, it, I think there's more people doing good than, than not. And I always try to find the silver lining in things. I always try to f stay positive. I, I think as the mayor, I mean, it's my job to be the ambassador for the city in a positive way, but also, you know, be, deal with the serious issues that we have. Um, you know, I grew up as a cheerleader, so I know how to be the cheerleader uh, when necessary, but these are serious issues that we're right. having economic issues. You know, our city was also the first to uh, enact an eviction moratorium. And we did it not just for residential, but for commercial tenants. Wow. Because we have so many small businesses and a lot of them restaurants in our community mm -hmm. that are their renters. And mm -hmm. we didn't want them to lose their business because of that. And then we created business grants. I just got a report today that we had 400 applicants uh, we've given out almost 200 uh, business grants up totaling $1.2 million um, already. And so we are really trying to keep these, most of them are using it to pay rent. So right. the rent is getting paid uh, <laughs> and the city is paying for the rent. <laughs> um, so we kept people in their space. We kept people in their homes and now we're giving the grants to pay the rent. We also have, uh, we passed a, uh, we created an item for tenant residential tenant relief, and we're going to be uh, rolling that out here pretty soon too, um, because you know homelessness and housing is one of our council priorities and addressing, and we don't want people becoming homeless because of COVID. Um, it's easier to care for people, even if they're very very poor, if right. they're in a home. Oh, and in some cases, I mean, whether it's seniors, I mean, I remember, when, and you know, the homeless issue has been a big thing in Orange County, right? So yeah. very recently, I mean, it, was, it came to a kind of a head, but I, I remember looking at it and there were some astounding statistics, like as far as, you know, what is some of the fastest growing segments of the homeless and the fact that it was, you know, seniors that were one medical bill away from basically being homeless or and women, or oh, women's yeah. women. Yeah. Yeah, or fa like, like young young families and women. I mean, it, 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 it is definitely an issue that we as a community need, must address. And to your point, it's a lot easier to basically try to ward that off by correct, correct action or assistance, a hand hand up, if you will, right? Uh, than to basically then have to deal with it from, a, from another point of crisis. I, 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 I really appreciate taking the time, Katrina. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm saddened that I don't live in Costa Mesa because I definitely vote for you. Uh, but you can it, 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 join us anytime. Oh, oh I, I, I will, for sure I will. And I know enough people I will basically put be in, be in their bonnets. But no, seriously, I think it's very clear for me sometimes when you, ex you you encounter leadership, and this is really the, where the rubber meets the road for me. Not yes, it's a crisis, right? And 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 sometimes we have leaders, and they're doing the right thing. You've been in the on council since two thousand six, and so you know it's not like a short duration. You've been on there, and and you are the same person that you were there. You're more seasoned, but you're the same core person. And so you know sometimes these crises come along, and they really highlight leadership. 
and I definitely know it when I see it and I see it in you. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you being on. I, I really, I'm glad that we were able to make this happen and I wish you luck. I don't think you need it, but I wish you luck in your upcoming uh, reelection and uh, look okay, forward to yeah. staying in touch for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for being a voice and offering uh, opportunities for people to share their experiences, their work, their projects. Uh, uh, and thanks for supporting, I think, uh, the, the good public health, economic health uh, policies that we really have to focus on these next couple months so that we can all move into 2021 and let's just put 2020 behind us. Uh, I think, I, I, I think, I think, I think there's going to be a lot of good learning that happens in 2020. I think so. And, and I, and I think every once in a while, a reset is not a bad thing. And so I, I'm like you, I kind of want to look at, find the silver lining in something, but with a practicality. And I think we are being offered a reset yeah. on some things and a little room to actually think versus just be constantly running. So with that, I will uh, wish you a good evening and I will be in touch. I'm sure we'll connect at some point, but thank you again, Katrina, very much for being on the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.